Hey everyone, it's Michael here at Home Health Success Academy and welcome to the module two portion of starting your home care company. And in this video series, we're going to be talking about creating mission, vision, and value statements, how to be able to put together your business objectives, your goals and objectives, how to be able to find out what are the different advantages and disadvantages of probably opening up your own company, your own business. Uh, we're going to share with you guys keys and obstacles to success of business operations, um, talking about should you open up a home-based business or should you go out there and rent a space in the community. Um, we're also going to be talking about home care franchising. Uh, there's a lot of franchise organizations out there offering you know, their expertise and allowing you to be able to purchase a certain location depending on what's available within their company and they'll help you with your startup. Um, and then at the same time as talking about, you know, the different franchise agreements, what you should be looking into before joining a franchise company and moving on furthermore. So this is important to be able to find out, hey, you know what, should I just decide to use a franchise organization and franchise myself in? Or do I just bootstrap it and start my own company from the ground by myself, by naming it by myself, and relying on what I learned, like for example, what you learned from this video series, or things that you can actually research out there in the community. So let's go ahead and get started. So starting and operating a home care business is an exciting and challenging experience, right? So as a potential home care business owner, you should possess the entrepreneurial flair. Okay, you have to be able to say, hey, you know what? I can open up a business. I have that entrepreneurial spark within me that is going to make me want to be able to, first of all, take calculated risks, um, willing to be able to put in a lot of hard work to get your business off the ground and running and have a genuine interest in serving the needs of the senior population. So before making a hasty decision, conduct an honest personal assessment. You need to be able to assess yourself. You know, take into consideration your likes, your dislikes, your habits, your work ethics, skill sets, and you know, suitability for this type of work. Also consider your goals, your expectations, and commitment, all of which will largely contribute to the success or even the failure of your venture. And you need to be able to know that, right? So, you know, what type of person are you? Can you, you know, start a company? Can you, you know, commit to making the decision of starting your own company and, you know, see it through? A lot of the times, it's, there's a lot of people out there who we call entrepreneurs who, you know, keeps talking about, you know, if I own my own business, you know, this is what I'm going to do. Well, you know, when you make that decision, when you make that jump, that commitment to be able to start your own company, you're there. And how quickly can you get it started is one of the most important things. And that's why a lot of people decide to do the franchise thing because, you know, they're paying the, you know, additional sums of money, the investment, because there's somebody who can actually take care of a lot of the parts of the application for them. Um, and then we're going to talk about, like I said, in this video series, the disadvantages of franchising and even the advantages of it. And so we want to definitely be able to, first of all, look into mission, vision, and value statements. So creating a vision, a mission, and value statements are very important because they are the essence of what you want your business to be able to represent. They will serve as a standard for all future planning and will guide your decision on the delivery of your in-home care services. When you use it properly, the mission, the vision, the value statements can be powerful tools, especially for new businesses. They provide directions for a business, without which it is difficult to develop a cohesive plan. Now, one thing I have seen a lot in this industry is that there's a lot of cookie cutter mission, vision, and value statements out there. I've even seen it where other companies will just rip off a mission, vision, value statements from other companies and just use it for their own organization. There's nothing wrong doing that, 
But the question is, can you actually read it and actually believe in it and follow through with what you are putting as your statement? Because if you are already faking your mission, your vision, your value statements and not even knowing it, then right there alone, you're starting off on the wrong leg. And another thing that goes with your mission, vision and, and values is that you know, when you create these things, it gives a story of why you're actually wanting to get into this business and this industry. You know, one thing that I do as a consultant working with multiple companies out there, you know, I would ask an owner, I say, hey, what's your mission, vision, and value statement? They don't even know what that is. They don't even know what it is. If I ask an employee what it's about, they don't even or cannot even recite it. They'll say something very bland, like our goal is to be able to provide amazing quality care to a senior community to be able to keep them comfortable at their own home. Now, most you know statements out there are similar, but they cannot even say it verbatim. And so this is one thing that if you are hiring people, you want them to know your mission, vision, and values. And you want to make sure that they actually memorize it and know that this is what describes this particular company that they're working for. So a mission statement. You know, missions and visions are core building blocks necessary for business planning and development. Although they are often used interchangeably, mission and visions are two separate concepts. You know, a mission statement documents the essence or purpose of your business. What's the purpose of your business? You know, it, it will focus, you know, on that practical description of what your business is attempting to accomplish. The mission statement is a starting point. It's that beginning point that drives planning and gives you that focus for your business over time. The mission statement should be a concise statement of business strategy and development from the client's perspective, and it should fit with the vision of your business. Your mission statement should answer three particular questions. Number one, what do we do? Number two, how do we do it? And number three is, for whom do we do it? So some examples of mission statements would be, to provide quality service to help our clients lead dignified, independent lifestyles in the comfort and safety of their homes by carefully assessing their needs and selectively placing trained personals, personnels to meet these needs. Example number two would be to provide a high standard of in-home care to individuals in need to enable them to remain living in the comfort of their own home. So this is an example of mission statements. You know, so my advice for you right now is maybe pause this video and actually, you know, grab a pen and paper and you should actually have a pen and paper with you at all time while watching these videos so you can start taking notes. Okay. So I want you guys to try to piece, you know, a two sentence, three sentence, you know, mission statement about what describes your company. So think about that right now. Let's move on to vision statements. The vision statement describes what you would like your business to achieve. A vision statement is more fluid than a mission statement and likely to change over time. It's okay to change your vision statements, your mission statements, because that's what businesses do, right? It evolves. It's, you know, it's a living organism that eventually starts finding new ways. And so you should be able to update this. But always understand everything, anytime that you update any of these things, especially in your handouts, in your handbooks, in your employee handbooks, you must also make sure that your team and your staff is aware of these changes. So like I said, it should include clear attainable goals to guide a decision making. Yet at the same time, it should be general enough to allow alternative responses to changing conditions. Simply put, the vision statement should reflect what you ultimately envision your business to be in terms of growth, values, employees, service delivery, and contributions to your community. So review vision statements from organizations that have mission statements similar to yours. This will help you organize your thoughts and articulate your own vision. And so, you know, it is okay, like I said, to look at other companies, but, you know, it's okay to literally say, hey, you know what? I like their vision statement. It's okay to replicate that, but make sure that this is learned by your team and your staff within the organization itself. So an example of a vision statement would be, to be known as the agency of choice for providing quality home care in the community, to provide home care services that will meet the social, spiritual, emotional, and physical needs of clients and families in the communities. 
you know, your business statements is something that your team can actually use in your marketing aspect of things, right? There could be a variety of different vision statements. Like if I'm working with a hospital, my vision statement for the hospital is something different than my vision statement for working with a rehab facility to be able to bring your patients into my company. So like, let's say, for example, in a hospital, I tell them, you know, the vision of our company is to be able to work with hospitals to be able to decrease the readmission rates of patients back to the hospitals, which one, allows the patient to stay comfortable at their home. And number two, you know, prevents hospital from losing, you know, their payments from Medicare, Medicaid, or other insurances. So, you know, think about your vision statements. Take a pause really fast on this video and, you know, write down what could be your vision statement right now at this very moment. Values and beliefs. So values can be defined as principles, standards, or even qualities considered worthwhile or desirable. The manner and way in which you deliver home care services for your clients will be based on the values and beliefs that you set for your business. So these values and beliefs shape the vision, the mission, the objective goals of your agency. All right, moving on to goals and objectives. So goals and objectives provide a focus for the services that you're going to provide. You know, process and activities and a framework of evaluation to ensure and sustain quality services and financial viability in your community. Your goal and objectives should be clearly defined and based on the mission, the vision, the values, and beliefs of your businesses. Now, if we talk about your business objectives, objectives give the business a clearly defined target. Like, what's your target? What is your plan and your goals, right? So, you know, plans can then be made to achieve these targets and can also motivate employees. They enable a business to measure the progress towards its stated aim, which is the direction that the business wants to go in the future. In other words, an aim is its goals or statements for purpose. So what are your goals? What's the goal for your business? Do you want your, you know, your census to go from zero to 50 within the next six months? Or do you want it to grow from zero to 100 average monthly, um, you know, client census within a year? What is the business objectives that you guys have? And the truth is this, is that I try to chunk my objectives and my goals on a weekly basis. So, you know, because sometimes as if you have that, you know, that far away long goal, it can be um, problematic at times. And, you, you know, you're you're stuck in a curve sometimes. So for me, why is I tell my team, okay, this is what's going to happen between today and, and, and a week from now. And this is what's going to happen from today to a month from now. This is what's going to happen from this month to the next quarter. So you can also change your business objectives and goals as you go. Now, the criteria for effective business objectives. The most effective business objectives meet the following criteria. Pretty much a smart, effective business objective. So S you know, which is specific, objectives are, I mean, are aimed at what the business does. Example, you might have an objective of finding 10 new clients the first month of the business. Measurable, the business can put a value to the objective, right? You want to achieve a $10,000 in client billing in the first month. Agreeable, objectives are agreed upon by all those individuals in trying to achieve them, right? So let's say your marketing team, um, your um, client service team, your office team, the administrators have an agreeable objective. It must also be realistic, right? You know, your objectives should be challenging, but should also be able to be achieved with the resources available. And that's why sometimes, you, you know, going on with an objective or a goal for a whole year or within the next five years, you know, should you should understand that things can change or things can come up during this whole time. So you want to be realistic to what can actually happen, but at the same time is you don't want to downgrade your objectives as well. And the last one is time specific. Objectives have to have a time limit for achievement. You know, example, objectives should be met by the end of the year, by the end of the month, by the end of the week, by the end of the quarter, right? And try to keep away from saying, hey, this is what's going to happen within five years from now. So what are the advantages and disadvantages uh, to owning your own business? Number one, advantage, you are your own boss. You have control over the hows, the whys, the whens, the wheres, the whats, and who's of running your business. You have creative rights. You make your own decisions. You have taxation benefits as well. You don't have to rely or report to an upper management, or you don't have to answer to a franchise organization. 
So the disadvantages, you know, there is a relatively high risk of failure, right? So what's the percentage of businesses that fail every year? You know, they say 80% of all restaurants will close down, you know, within five years of opening. So it's the same exact thing for almost any business. And the reason why is it's not really, you know, the industry, but a lot of people fail to understand that, you know, other than creating a company, you know, there's that movie um, by um, Kevin Costner about the baseball film, right? You know, if you build it, they will come. Just because you decide to get an office space, just because you got a business card, a phone, a telephone line, a fax machine, that does not mean, or just because you even got a website or, you know, advertised out there, that does not mean that people are going to come in and start, you know, referring patients to you, right? So we have to understand that, you know, we are putting ourselves at risk. You know, we're upfronting money to be able to make this gamble. Um, but the question is, do you gamble or do you actually make sure you analyze everything correctly? And at the same time, is make sure that you adjust yourself as things goes, right? The workload is heavy and the hours are long. It is a big misconception that people say is that I want to start my business because I want to have more time with my family. I always say when you start a business, it's like adopting a new child, right? And the reason for that is you're adopting a child. You don't know where they came from. You know, you don't know what's going on. You're not starting off things from scratch. And so, you know... You have to understand that it is never, ever, ever going to be a cakewalk if you're starting a business. And you will have to give your sweats, your blood, your tears into this business because you want it to grow and you want it to mature. Okay, This is not a three-year plan. Most people that open up businesses, they want to make it a lifetime thing. They don't want to work for a person anymore or they want to be able to make sure that they have an additional item that can actually bring in more money for the family, another flow of income, okay? And then also, when you're the owner, guess what? You cannot blame anybody else. Everything comes up to you. An owner, whatever time I meet an owner that says, oh, the reason why we're failing is because of my marketer. The reason that we're failing is because my, my caregiver out there, you know, did something bad and it made us look bad, okay? So you have to understand, when you are a business owner, everything runs down and stops in your doorstep, you're responsible for everything. The reason why you have a bad marketer is because you hired that marketer. The reason why you have a bad caregiver, you didn't properly train your, your management team on how to hire somebody. And so they just, you know, did not screen it properly and brought in the wrong person to work for your company. Are there going to be mistakes here and there? Yes. But in the end, no matter what, people are always going to blame it to you. You're the business owner. You're the decision maker right? When you're that one person, you're the only person in the end of the line, right? So when you work for another organization, you can always blame somebody below you. You can always blame your supervisor, your manager, and the president and the CEO. When you have your own company, the blame stops on your doorsteps, right? And also, income might be inconsistent at times, right? So, you know, you can be making a lot of money one month, but then all of a sudden, patients end up dying or patients end up in the hospital that you lose clients and so your billable hours will be lesser than you did last quarter and so that can be problematic as well and a lot of times is the reason why a lot of agencies fail or have problems is because they don't fill their pipeline there should always be people that you're targeting always even though you're already fully booked with your caregivers i would rather have a problem of having to find new caregivers to assign to new patients rather than having multiple caregivers ready to go without any patients out there to be able to give them. So let's look at the uh, keys and obstacles to a successful business operation. You, okay, you, the business owners, right, the business owner, the business entrepreneur can have a great impact, a great, great, great impact, you know, on whether your business is a success or not a success by what you do and what you do not do, okay? So let me share with you guys some of the keys to success, right? You actually need to be successful, you know, if you actually do what? If you research and understand the home care market. You know, I met so many owners out there that don't even know the, the top five diagnosis of patients, of senior patients out there, right? 
And, you know, you must understand the market that you're in. You must be able to research and take time for that. You must undertake a feasibility study and develop a business plan. I don't, I have a lot of people that I have worked with that they bring us to be able to consult for their company. And I say, do you guys have a business plan? And they say yes. Uh, because it was required by them, for example, by the state. And then all of a sudden, when we asked for the business plan, I said, okay, are you guys um, following the business plan? And they'll say, well, I don't really know what it's all about. <laughs> so they hired somebody to create a business plan, but they didn't follow it. And so that's going to cause problems for you in the future if you don't follow that. You know, you must also conduct a self-assessment. You need to assess yourself. You need to be able to assess your team as well. You, you know, you need to hire the right staff. You need to provide superior client services. You need to choose the appropriate geographical area, okay? Um, it's important that you need to study. Just because, okay, I live, let's say, for example, in Orlando, that I want to open up my business in Orlando. What if I go a little bit up north where there's less competition and maybe I can service that particular area? Would that be a lot better for me? So, you know, even your geographical area, you must be able to understand where you're opening your company. You know, you need to advertise effectively. You need to develop, develop a strong, effective marketing plan. You need to have that positive attitude. You can't be thinking negative all the time. So those are some of the basic keys to be able to create a successful company. Now, let's talk about the obstacles, right? What are the obstacles to success? You know, you don't evaluate personal su suitability or not being truthful during self-analysis, right? You do not have sufficient expertise and or capabilities. And guess what? Like I said, of anybody that wants to start an agency in this industry doesn't have to have knowledge about the industry right away, but you can learn that. That's what Google's for. That's what Bing is for. That's what YouTube is for. You know, you're watching this video right now because you're trying to research right now, you know, should you start a home care company or what are the things that you need to learn? And, you know, I congratulate you for watching this video and for, for to be able to join us in this training. Um, did you conduct a real feasibility study or did you actually create a business plan? Did you keep records? Do you have sufficient cash flow? Um, you do not provide good management. You do not hire the right staff. These are obstacles of success of, you know, to your success. You do not pay attention to the competition, right? You know, if you think that you're going to offer the same service as the competition, well, what makes you different from them? You must be able to differentiate yourself. You know, cash flow, when I first started in the industry, you know, I was working 60 hours a week, you know, working night shift while we're trying to get everything started during the daytime for the company. You know, so you guys have, you have to understand you have to put some work into this. You can't just all of a sudden get that loan and think that you're going to win. You know, other people fail or have obstacles because they do not provide adequate delivery of the services. I've seen agencies lose referrals because they cannot staff that particular client within that period right there, the family signed the paperwork that they want services. They can't find a caregiver. Um, I've seen also companies um, decide that they want to expand too quickly. They want to have a second location. They want to be able to, you know, um, offer more services. And they did not assess it properly or see that, hey, can they handle the workload? They're just thinking, let me increase my workspace, my work area, my coverage, and you know, which allows me to find more patients. No, you can find patients within your area. The reason why I can say that is because your competition is getting patients. Every patient, every client that your competition got, that could have been yours. So you have to understand, it's not about expansion. It's about being able to be, you know, figuring things out in your community and really managing yourself to be able to get out there and get your company noticed to be able to win in this industry. So let's talk about home-based businesses, right? And, you know, what are the advantages and the disadvantages of having a home-based business? And the reason why we say home-based business is that a lot of home care companies are actually started at people's homes, okay? Because a lot of people are trying to save some money. And there is nothing wrong starting a agency within your home. And the reason for that is this. Typically, your patients are not, not going to be coming to your office. They're going to be going. You're going to be going and to their homes, into their family members' homes, into the you know community like the hospitals, the nursing homes, the assisted living facilities to be able to get these patients. It is rare that 
people that are going to refer patients to you are going to come to your office, okay? So let's go ahead and talk about the different advantages and disadvantages of starting a home-based business. You know, one advantage is that it is less expensive than a community-situated businesses as overhead costs are low. So I've seen offices starting off somewhere around between $700 to about $1,000 a month for a decent size office space. And right there alone is if you're starting off from scratch and you're, you want to be able to pinch the pennies a little bit, you know, it's okay to save the money by not having an overhead cost for a location, okay? And then there is a lower risk of expensive mistakes. There is an opportunity to use household resources for business use, right? We all have staplers at home, right? So, you know, if you're opening up your office at home, well, guess what? You have a stapler. That's a great thing, Right. And then there's that gradual startup you know, and growth. Because here's one thing. If you have an office space and you're paying $1,000 a month for this particular office space, all you have to think about is plain and simple. Is you need to be able to come up with that $1,000 to be able to pay for that. So you better be able to have you know, a client to service right away, build profit, or else you know, you're going to have to dip and take money away from your own savings. Okay? So this allows you to be able to save money. And then also commuting time is reduced, right? Time is money. I would rather be able to, hey, go out straight out there marketing rather than having to report to the office. And if your office is within your house, then guess what? It's a lot easier to be able to not lose any time because you can start working right away. There's also no assigned standard for dress codes, right? So, But here's the thing about that. Um, just because that there's no assigned dress codes, that does not mean you're, you're working the phone, you know, in your undies or in your pajamas and everything. You know, when I've actually had my home-based businesses, you know, I still dressed up for work. You're not going to see me wear a suit and tie at home just to do work in my home-based office, but I still make sure that I get up. I still make sure that I get ready. I still make sure that I do everything that I do to myself to prepare myself like I'm going to an office, a real office, okay? So it also provides a relatively inexpensive way to test the market. The business can start off on a part-time basis until enough reserves are obtained to make it a full-time venture. You know, yeah, you need to be, you can be able to test the market. Why, why is it? Well, number one is you're not stuck in a, um, you're not stuck in a lease, right? So sometimes if you're going to lease a, office space, the minimum you'll get is to be able to do it for a three-year lease. So if all of a sudden you feel that maybe a year, two years in, you're, this really is not for you, then at least you're not stuck on a lease that you have to continuously pay or else they'll go after you. You know, And another advantage is that individuals who use their homes for business purposes may even claim a tax portion of the related expenses on their income tax. And that is correct, okay? So this is something why you should actually make sure when you start a business, you know, not just talking to a lawyer, not just talking to a consultant like myself, but also be able to make sure that you have in your payroll an accountant. And I'm not talking about the H&R Block accountants out there. I'm not talking about the Liberty um, tax people. I'm talking about having a real accountant that can actually manage your books, that can actually do the long forms, because there's a lot of write-offs that you can actually do while you're starting this company, okay? So you must be able to learn those things, you know? So another advantage is that the amount that may be claimed for income tax purposes as well, right, is, is amazing, right? Because you can claim certain losses. Now, I'm not a, an accountant myself, but I've worked with plenty of accountants my, in my whole life so that I do understand some basic jargon, you know? Like, for example, you know, if you're using a space in your home, guess what? That's That right there is a write-off. It's an expense for you as well, and you should actually take advantage of that. Now, let's talk about the disadvantages. You know, the business will be less visible than it would be in a commercial space, right? And that's the truth as well. You know, but like I said, in the home care industry, we're not really out there to market our, our, our company itself. Now, unless you're going to get an office space that's going to be in the visible in the streets or you're going to get an office space that you're going to have a large sign outside, then that's then that is going to be a disadvantage. If that's something that you want to actually do. Now, another disadvantage is that a lot of discipline to work the required number of hours is required. You know, when you're at home. You know, you're stuck. Should I watch TV? Should I see what's the next episode of The Walking Dead? 
or should I make these phone calls? And so that can be very difficult as well, is that how can you differentiate what's work and what's not work? So like I said, I truly suggest that you know when it's clock in time, you devote yourself to the clock and make sure you, you devote yourself to the business. And I'm sure you guys have worked with coworkers who go to work and they work an eight hour shift, but you know that they only work four hours that whole eight hours because they were just spending time gossiping. And the question is, what type of employee are you? Also understand there's an isolation and loss of contact with colleagues. When you start, you know, when you were working in an office or a hospital or whatever like that, and you're you're used to having, you know, contact with other people, when you decide to start a business, a home-based business, well, guess what? You're not going to have that camaraderie no more. You're not going to have all these people that you can talk to every day that makes your day go by, you know, better. So you're going to be at home. You're going to be hustling there. So there can be that loss of contact. Um, family can infringe on work times. I've called some agencies at times, and all of a sudden you hear the kid in the background crying. You hear the dog barking. You hear, you know, the the TV just, just you know, just blasting loud out there, right? So your family can infringe on work time, and you know you don't want that to happen. You don't. You should not allow family to be in business, anyways, in your office. Okay, when work is work, family is family. Allow to make sure that you guys can separate those things. I've seen a lot of companies have problems because they bring family into the mix and don't know how to be able to separate that. There can be an increase in family stress. As the demand for work and families are juggled, a person's motivational level can drop. Now, can that happen? Of course it can, but it can even drop when you're working for another company, right? Dress can become sloppy. Like I said, don't go to work. Dress up in your pajamas, okay, or your undies, or just some, you know, some, some, you know, workout clothes. Come to work like you're going to work at another company. And you want to be able to understand that these are things that you need to adhere to, okay? Um, there are some places where there are restrictions, zoning restrictions, that does not allow you to be able to work at home. It all depends, right? There could be conflict with neighbors over noise, traffic, and parking problems. Now, this only happens... If your company starts growing, you have people working for you, you know, all of a sudden you have your employees parking in the streets, caught blocking things, and that can start causing problems, okay? So you also want to pay attention to that. Sometimes it's good to start to do work at home, but once you start increasing yourself and you see growth happening, eventually you're going to have to move out of the home and allow yourself to become or put yourself in a location, now, there also may be limitations and or regulations to operating home-based businesses. So make sure you find out what are the rules and laws within your company. Um, another disadvantage that, you know, I always say when it comes to leasing, um, getting a business office or staying at home is that when you stay at home, okay, you know, what ends up happening is that you saving money so much that you don't want to spend money. So you also want to avoid that, that you don't want to be cheap too much. And, and one thing I always tell people is this, that people sometimes put more value in something they spend money on because they're putting a risk on things. So always pay attention to that as well. Okay, so in the previous section, we talked about the possibility of you opening up your home care business at your home. So the next choice is to then open up your business in a community-based business, right? Meaning that you are now going to open up at an office or a shop, right? So, you know, if your decision is to operate a business at a location other than your home, then a site needs to be chosen, of course. So while location is not as critical for a home care business as it would for a retail store, there are still some factors that should be considered. The main objective is to find a spot that is convenient and accessible for clients. It should suit the needs of clients in the market for home care services. So some examples of a suitable place would be close proximity to one of the following places, right? So health units, medical clinics, senior citizen clubs, care facilities, social services, veterans administration, community resource offices, legions and other veteran organizations, neurological societies, hospices, and mall or downtown. 
Now, what I mean by mall is not, you know, the shopping mall, but more of like a strip mall type of a setup. Um, these are good ideas to be able to place your facility. Now, when choosing that facility, you know, being in this industry for a long time now, I've also seen a lot of office places where you walk in and there are like 10, 15 home health, home care companies in within one building. Um, I try not to suggest these type of places. Now, the one reason why I know a lot of companies do this is what they want to try to do is try to siphon other companies' employees, right, by giving them options. Now, you know, th that can be a good idea, but you guys have to understand, in, in this industry, a lot of the field staff don't even come into the offices no more, okay? They get their checks direct deposited for them, right? So, they're not even reporting to these offices. And when they come to these offices, they don't look around and say, who was in the building? You know, they, they're not really going to be doing that. They go straight to the office that they are familiar with. Now, when choosing a building between a office building and a strip mall, there are some good and bad choices. If you are going to rent out at a strip mall, okay, you have to understand one thing. With these type of locations, you're going to be in charge of paying for your own electricity, okay? So you're going to have a separate bill for electricity, a separate bill for water, um, a separate bill for disposal, like for your garbage units. You would have to rent one of those, you know, different size garbage units that's going to be placed in the back of the strip mall that you're in charge of because you can't really throw your garbage at somebody else's uh, containers. Um, I've seen some places do that, but you don't want to be that, you know, the bad neighbor in those strip malls. When you decide to actually rent out at a you know, office building, there is what they call the common area, right? So there's uh, bathrooms typically in the hallways that's shared throughout the building. And so you're not in charge of cleaning those by yourself. If you rent a location in a strip mall, you'll have your own private bathroom in there. But at the same time as you're in charge of cleaning that place up. And so the last thing you want to do, especially when you're trying to do a startup, is that having to do all the additional work like cleaning up as well and tidying up. So you want to try to keep that away from you having to do that. One thing I teach people is this, is that if you're opening up an organization, if you're opening up a company, your time is valuable. So instead of you spending time cleaning something, I want you to try to figure out what are you really worth? What's your value for every hour that you provide services for your company? And if it's landing somewhere around, you know, $15 of work, I would try to suggest that you try not to do that and you want to outsource that as much as possible. So if you rent an office building, you don't have to worry about cleaning the common areas. You don't really have to worry about um, handling additional utilities. You don't have to worry about cleaning, you know, the bathroom stalls and everything. And also, when you rent these places out in a office building, they also have a disposal unit. They already have a garbage container in the back of the buildings, so you don't even have to rent those. So, you know, you may have a better deal sometimes in strip malls, but there are additional charges that you would have to pay for. So what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to show you guys different ideas and what you can do. There's another company called Regents, right? So Regents owns a lot of buildings all over the United States as well as international as well. And so, you know, in the beginning, you can actually have a office address, a company address in a office building and not have to have an office there itself but you know and you, you're only going to be paying a minimum price typically for regents offices to be able to use their address so you can have mail going there so it's not going to your house because um, also think about it if you are renting a if you know you're at home you have a home-based business you may have to interview people at your own home and so for me wise i don't really want people going into my own home Right, so you can set up where you can rent 
a, a office um, an office for today, for example, at one of these Regents buildings, and you can conduct your interviews over there. That's one good idea to be able to hold that, right? So, you know, there's good and bad in regarding to what you do if you rent um, a community-based facility towards, you know, having your home as your home-based office. So these are things that you have to kind of figure out. And so that's why the importance of, you know, you know, setting up your business plan, creating that, um, you know, that that plan that you guys can create to be able to figure out what you really want to do, where you want to spend the money, where you want to hold back on several um, of expenses. So let's keep on moving on. Moving on to home care franchises, right? So First Light Home Care, Visiting Angels, Home Helpers, Comfort Keepers, Senior Helpers, Home Instead. Uh, these are some of the, you know, more famous uh, home care franchises out there. And there's actually plenty more that that exists. And so making the decision of actually franchising um, is also another choice that you may have. Um, and so what we want to do in this video series section is to be able to discuss, you know, the good and the bad, the advantages and disadvantages of franchising. And if you do decide to franchise, you know, what are the things that you need to find out before you get into an organization? So the franchiser, you know, meaning that franchising combines the expertise and marketing skills of a franchiser with the entrepreneurial vision and capital of a franchise, right? The franchisee, you, as a small business person, gains the advantages of a proven operational system with business management training and advertising while buying into a tested service or product. Each home care franchiser is different, right? And has different expectations of its franchisees. Each has its own level of support to offer and in turn expects varying degrees of conformity to its policies and procedures. So before investing in a franchise, you should learn everything you can about them, including their past records, where they are now, and where they plan to be in the near future. It will be up to you to determine the strengths and weaknesses of the franchiser. If financial assistance from a bank is required, be aware that banks prefer that the franchiser has been around for a long time, is run by competent management, demonstrates financial strength, and is up to date with their market, meaning the franchisee's clients. So the following is an overview of the franchise concept and a checklist of questions that you should ask in making an informed decision regarding the purchase of a home care franchise. You know, is the franchisor a private company? Is it a public company or is it a subsidiary of another company? Are the franchisor's financial statements available? Do the franchisor's financial statements show historically favorable trends? Does the financial viability of the franchisor appear assured for years to come? Has the franchisee under current ownership ever been placed into receivership or even bankruptcy? How many years has the franchisor operated in the industry? So you're going to see a lot of franchisors out there who, who's been in the business for 10 years. But the question is, they've had a working model, a company that's been open 10 years. But the question is, how long have they been franchising their business out there? Sometimes they've been, they've been existing for 10 years, but they've only started offering franchisee options for the past year. So these are questions you need to be able to understand. How long has this company been franchising? How has the franchisor ever been found to be guilty or liable of any litigation with franchisees? You know, are they having any difficulties right now? Like, so for example, um, 7-Eleven, for example, right now, they have a lot of franchisees out there, but there's a lot of, you know, legalities happening right now where the 7-Eleven franchisees are teaming up to you know, demand certain things from the 7-Eleven organization, okay? So you need to find out what's going on in your industry, and this is something that you have to make sure you make your own due diligence to do that. You know, not just asking a question, but actually researching, Googling it, using Bing, using YouTube, whatever you need to do. So what business experiences does the current management have in this business, in franchising? Because you're going to be surprised. Sometimes they'll bring in a CEO who doesn't even have experience in the, in the home health industry, the home care industry. They just have experience managing and running a company. So does that 
company, the franchisor, manage other franchisee systems, right? Do are they a company that is just in the business of buying, you know, franchisor groups and packaging that? Like so the best way to, you know, to think about it is that have you seen places where, you know, in one um, one building, they have a KFC, a Long John Silver, and a Taco Bell, or a, one of both in there. So these are things that you need to be able, you know, to be able to kind of look into and ask those questions. Okay, so you just have to be able to know what you need to ask. So does the franchisor, for example, have corporate stores that may compete with its franchisees? Like if you're going to get into a you know, a location, a, a area of operation, are you competing against one of the company-owned agencies? Okay, because these, these agencies, these franchisors, they have what they call company-owned locations and franchisee locations. So you need to be able to look into that. Will other franchise systems operated by the same franchisor be directly or indirectly competing with the franchisee that the entrepreneur is interested in? Right? Do they own multiple locations that can go up against you? And then you need to find out what are their plans for expansion. Okay, You need to be able to make sure you detail that and ask these questions. Don't just you know, go in and say, hey, you know what? I've seen your company around. I've heard about you, but not ask these type of questions. So the franchise system, let's talk about that. Operating a franchise means becoming a part of a system. If you are an individualist, you find that being part of a system is too constraining. The franchisor charges an upfront franchise fee as well as a royalty fee. So what do we mean by franchise fee and royalty fee? Franchise fee is because you're buying into the system. You're going to see a lot of franchisors out there charging $30,000 to $50,000 to be able to you know, get a location started. The royalty fee, typically you're going to see 3% to 7% gross. So meaning, let's say, for example, you are, you know, you bring in a client, you start servicing the client, and the client pays you, let's say, for example, $1,000. What happens is the company will get 3% to 7% of that $1,000, okay? And that's before you pay your employees, your facility location, your taxes and all. So they get 3 to 7%, depending on which franchisor that you actually deal with. So this is something that you need to be able to ask up front and find out from them. You should dissect these fees to determine exactly what they cover in order that you can be satisfied that value for your dollar is being attained. What the franchisee is buying is a method of doing business. And so why do you franchise? Well, you have a possibility of a proven system that they've created that allowed their company to grow and because of they have a set of policies and procedures a set of how to be able to run the organization you're buying into that right there okay so it's pretty much similar to what you're doing right now you're watching this video series on how to be able to start a home care company a lot of people don't know how to do that or how to find the information so rather than them doing that they go into a franchise business so that they can just have that organization help them with every single step to open up those locations you need to be able to look into the franchisee agreement right so in a franchisee agreement the system you will be working under is laid out in the form of a franchisee agreement this agreement is what you are bound to operate by and will have to abide with as a franchisee so typically, for example, if you want to add certain services that the franchisee doesn't offer as a group, you cannot add that because it has to be approved by a corporate system. Just think about it. For example, like McDonald's, you know, those are owned by corporate, but as well as franchisee locations. A franchisee location can't all of a sudden add an extra thing in the menu that the McDonald's organization does not approve or does not say they can do. So it's the same exact thing within, you know, you franchising a, you know, a home care business. So following are some of the questions you should ask as well, right? What are the duration and renewal terms of the franchisee agreement? Meaning that, you know, 
do I have to renew after three years, after five years? Or how long does this agreement work? Because I've known people where they decided that after you know one set of agreement, let's say, for example, it's a five-year agreement, that they decided that they just want to go on their own. And they don't want to use that franchisee's or that franchisor's name no more. Okay? You need to be able to ask what significant events can cause the termination of the franchisee agreement, meaning that you know, can they just decide to cut you off? Or, you know, are there things that if you decide to do that you make a mistake on that they can actually grab everything away from you? So you need to be able to find out what system is in place to resolve disputes between franchisors and franchisees. Um, are there franchisee organizations and associations where you can meet up with other franchisees to be able to, you know, ask questions? Uh, what are the limitations or of territorial protection of any, right? So what we mean about that is that what are the limitations? So let's say, for example, you're in the Chicago area, all right, and you're working, let's say, maybe in the um, south suburbs of Chicago. So one good example is there's one home care company that I know in that area. Um, they're in charge of three um, local cities in that area that has a good amount of population. But let's say, for example, you're working in those three cities, but then one of your referral source gives you a referral, but that particular patient lives on another city that's within your area that you can reach, but unfortunately is not in those three city names that you actually service. Well, guess what? You cannot provide service for that. That's going to end up going to another company within the franchise organization because you cannot be taking patients away from them. So you have limitations. And that's one thing that in, in the franchise industry you can face, right? So that's why some companies will at times decide to just go on their own because if they go on their own, they can actually cover every place that they want to, you know, and that makes it a lot better for them. So there's a, a larger um geographic area that they can cover, whereas when you are working with a franchisee organization, you're unfortunately going to have to only cover what cities that they give you. Now, a lot of franchiser organizations allows you to be able to purchase two packages. You can get these, this area right here and the conjoining area right there, so you can have six cities. But guess what? That right there, you're going to end up paying for two locations, so those franchise upfront fees you have to pay double of those. You may get a discount a little bit if you do it together, um, but at the same time, as these are questions you need to be able to make sure you ask. You need to ask them, will the franchisor own or head lease the location? A good example for that is that do they actually have an agreement where they actually will be in charge of the lease of that location? So, you know, when you think about McDonald's, I love using McDonald's when we talk about franchising is because McDonald's does a good job. A lot of people don't even know that the primary business that McDonald's is in is the fact that they are actually a real estate company, meaning that any McDonald's that you guys see that exists, if it's either company owned or franchisee owned, the location is actually owned by McDonald's itself, which means any franchisee that actually has a, has a McDonald's franchise they still have to pay a lease towards McDonald's because McDonald's owns that particular location. You also need to find out how much will additional training cost, right? They may give you initial training, but any additional training, they might want you to pay for those as well. They may ask you to even pay for, you know, conferences that they may have yearly as well. You know, what ongoing market support can the franchisee expect? Meaning that are they advertising? You need to find that out. What percentage of what's being paid to, to the company goes into marketing? Okay. And you guys also have to understand, let me ask this one question. When was the last time you actually saw a commercial for a franchise organization providing home care? So you need to find out what are what are they doing to, to market the organization? Where are they marketing the organization? How are they marketing the organization? How much are they spending to be able to do that? Right? You need to find out how will advertising contributions be utilized? How much are the franchisees royalty payments? How frequently are the royalties paid? Okay? So typically most franchisors out there, you know, collect their royalties on a monthly basis. Um, there's some franchisors out there that does it quarterly, but typically most home care franchisors are doing monthly 
payments for royalties. So services by the franchise system. A potential franchisee should know everything there is to know about the service the franchise system delivers. Understandably, service that is of good superior quality or value is a good business bet, but these are not the only criteria for judging the competitive strength of the services. There are good profits to be made or lost in services, which are not essentially different from others in the market. One franchisee can be much the same as another, but if its marketing is superior, it can overpower the competition. And you guys have to understand, when you open up this business, you cannot rely on a franchisor to do everything to bring you patience. In the end, it's your business. It's your job to go out there and market. They're going to give you everything that you need to be able to market your company. But in the end, it's up to you to be able to market your company out there. So let's talk about obtaining input from experienced franchisees, right? Typically, when you're deciding to franchise an organization, before I even reach out to a company, I will actually try to talk to, you know, people who've actually franchised that company. So let's say, for example, if I'm deciding to use Visiting Angels, I'm going to try to reach out to other Visiting Angels owners and franchisees and see if they would want to talk. There are typically... Um, rules and regulations where the company will not allow any franchisee to disclose information but that doesn't mean you know you can't ask certain questions that would be allowed to okay so people who are already operating franchisees can be of help right try to get to know them and profit from their own experiences example existing franchisees are a good source of information about the franchisor if the franchisor is not responsive to the individual or collective needs of the franchisees you may not even choose to get involved with that organization, right? You haven't signed those agreements yet, so you don't have to, you know, be stuck with that. As well, on the other hand, if the franchisor receives nothing but glowing reports from their franchisees, you probably want to be able to find a winner out of that, right? So try to get a feeling for how becoming a franchisee affects your life. It is a major business commitment, but it is also a personal and family commitment, too. You are now at the point wherein decisions need to be made about the time, effort, and money you'll put into a franchise. So are you prepared to make that commitment? You need to be able to ask yourself that right here, right now, and be able to make that decision so that you can be one step to doing what you want to be able to do. So the following questions will help you determine if you want to make this commitment. What was the total startup cost? So, you know, what is that total startup cost? How much is it going to take to be able to, you know, start a home care company? So the way I ask this is that I want you to be able to grab a pad paper and I want you to be able to put a line in the middle of the paper. And on one side, the franchising and the other one is doing it on my own. And what you can do is you can actually start writing these numbers down, right? What was the total startup cost? Where, you know... Are there any hidden costs when purchasing the franchise? How long does it take before the business reaches break even point? You know, because think about it. If you are going to be committing $30,000 on a franchise organization, and with these franchise organizations, they do not allow you to have a business at home. You cannot have a home-based business. They want you to have a physical location. So you guys have to know that, right? So, you know, if your cost to be able to franchise an organization is $30,000, for the franchise fee itself, you know, don't forget that you still have additional fees, your locations, uh, the computer systems, your desks, your supplies, all these kind of things for to be able to do a startup. Typically, if you are going to be doing a startup franchise, uh, most franchise organizations will tell you uh, the startup cost to be able to get into this business is around a hundred to one hundred fifty thousand um, dollars, and so. You know, do you have the funds to be able to do that, right? And so imagine if you are investing somewhere around, let's say, just even $50,000 to a franchise organization to start it up, you know, how long is it going to take you to be able to break even and get that money back and at the same time as not be worrying about everything because you still have to pay for your, you know, your, your salary, the facilities, and all these other expenses, you know? And, you know, was the franchisor's training adequate? Sometimes you have to ask yourself that, you know? When you talk to them, how much training are they going to give you? Are they going to go out there in the field with you and show you how it's done to market the company? 
you know, have any franchisees had any serious disagreements with the franchisors, you want to find that. This is the second time I, I, I've spoken about that, but you need to find that out. You need to find out, are the franchisees satisfied with the marketing and advertising support? You know, when you're looking into this business, you will have to sign a non-disclosure agreement, an NDA, as they say, if you're doing the first step into franchising. And this allows you to be able to get contact information for franchisees in your area as well as all over the U.S. and allows you to be able to contact them once you've signed an NDA or what they call a non-disclosure agreement. Okay, um, And by asking these people, by being able to make phone calls, don't just call someone in your area. Call out, out of state as well. That's, that's my biggest suggestion. Just like anything else, when you're hiring a worker for you, an employee, you should do what they call a reference check. Same exact thing when you're getting into a franchise agreement, you should do reference checks and you should actually do more than 20. Okay? I would suggest you do more than 20, you know, background checks, meaning you're going to try to speak to at least a minimum of 20 franchisees out there and get their input and what are things that they would suggest you to be able to get okay but of course you know just because you get this information no tattletaling don't be going to the franchise company and saying hey well you know your location 068 over in North Carolina told me that you guys are having these kind of problems so don't snitch on these companies if they're willing to give you some information that you know franchiser organizations wouldn't want you to hear so let's go ahead and start talking about the advantages and disadvantages of getting into a franchise. I think this is an important topic that we should discuss, right? So what are the advantages? You are buying a, a tried and tested system, supposedly, okay? So depends on which franchiser you're getting into. So that's why you really have to um, look into that and research. I'm telling you guys one thing. There are a lot of people who have franchise organizations and they are doing really amazing, okay? You need to be able to know that, right? So a reputable franchisor should have no difficulty in demonstrating the viability of the business. Um, another advantage is that you are benefiting from a franchisor's experience and knowledge, thereby reducing the scope of making mistakes. You, they already know the mistakes that they've been facing before when they ran this industry, when they ran this business. So you learning from mistakes is a great, great thing. That's why we do a lot of these free videos. That's why we do a lot of these trainings such as this that you're doing right now. And the reason for that is we want you to be able to learn from the mistakes. The best way to do good in business is to learn from people's mistakes and know how not to face those and how to solve it faster rather than facing the mistakes and making the mistakes yourself. Okay, so in many cases, you will be taking advantage of the name and the reputation which has already been built up by the franchisor. A properly tested and structured franchise system offered by a competent franchisor offers more of a safety net than going into business independently. As with any, any form of self-employment, you'll be working for your own future, not somebody else's. But also understand that if you get into a franchise organization, you're still reporting to somebody above you, right? So there is some form of checks and balances and there's some form of a boss still. A lot of people that decide to start their own company is because they don't really want to work for somebody else. They would want to say that they work for themselves and they respond and answer to their own selves rather to somebody up there in management. So let's talk about disadvantage of franchising. As a franchisee, you are not entirely your own boss, right? Like I said. So also, finding out about a franchise is a costly and time-consuming business. Extensive research is vital when choosing a franchisee. Buying a business format franchisee does not come cheap at all. Like I said, it goes from between thirty to 50000 just for your um, initial buy-in. And also, the failure of the franchisor can leave the franchisee with a business which is not viable as an independent operations. There are several home care franchisors out there that have closed up shop as well. And so, unfortunately, ends up leaving the franchisees in limbo, okay? So, if control of the franchise changes hands, it could be for the better, but it could also be for the worse. And so, you need to be able to be active in knowing what's going on into this industry, okay? You are very much dependent upon the ability of the franchisor and other franchisees to maintain the integrity of the brand. 
so here you are selling this product, but then let's say, for example, your neighboring uh, franchisee that controls the other side of the area, um, unfortunately, got into some bad mojo, right? Got into some bad press. That can cause problems for your company because guess what? You guys are all operating under the, under the belt of the same brand. And so you're relying on that. Okay, so we discussed the several ways to be able to make a decision on how you're going to start your agency. Are you going to do it by creating a home-based business? Like meaning, are you going to have your agency open up at your home and use your home address and, and you know, provide a certain location within your home to use it as your uh, home-based business? Or are you going to get a uh, lease a facility? Um, somewhere in the community, like in a, in a strip mall, in an office building, or wherever? Or are you going to get into franchising? And are you just going to try to pay a company so that they can use their training, their ideas, their management, and help you learn how to be able to run the business? Now, we want to be able to give you all three options regarding what you should do to start your business. Always remember, if you're going to franchise, you can never use your home as an address for a franchise organization because they actually want you to have an office space. Uh, so there's a lot of decisions you have to actually make. And, you know, are you going to pay the $30,000 to a franchise organization or are you going to use that $30,000 franchise fee to just use it within your company and start it from scratch? So these are decisions that you have to make, either or. The reason why we provide this training is to be able to give you all the information that you need to put together and say, hey, this is a great idea. Now, in the next video series that we're gonna have, we're gonna talk about feasibility studies. And no matter what, in a feasibility study, you should do that whether it's gonna be for a home-based business, a community-based business, or a franchise business. So I hope you enjoyed this particular section. And if you have any questions, always give us a call. We want to be able to help you create this successful business. Hey everyone, it's Michael here at Home Health Success Academy and I just want to say thank you for joining us on this quick video. My intentions for today is to be able to get you guys to start using our online marketing university. The intention here is to be able to have you guys make sense of why joining our online learning platform is what's going to be able to create success for your agency, okay? And we want to be able to give you all information that you need to create success. A lot of agencies nowadays are having problems how to be able to get more referral sources, how to be able to get their current referral source to give them more patience, how to go after past referral source that you lost to another agency, how to be able to increase your revenue, right? A lot of agencies are closing down nowadays, and our intention is to be able to give you all the knowledge that we share with clients of ours that pays us thousands of dollars to be able to manage their marketing team and their agency. So we're reaching out to home health agencies. These are the skilled nursing agencies, right, that, that bills Medicare and insurances and Medicaid. Then we also want to reach out to the non-medical, the caregiving and homemaker agencies, and especially hospice agencies as well. And we definitely want to be able to have owners, administrators, especially marketers and liaisons for companies to be able to take this online program, an online platform that's going to give you everything, all the knowledge you need to be able to create success in marketing your company. Remember, marketing your agency Selling your services is 100% of your revenue and is in charge of pretty much paying your salary, paying your employee salary, pay, paying your co-worker salary. This is what we have in our online university. We're showing you how to be able to create your target market, how to be able to look out into the into the area that you're in, figure out who are the right targets you need to be able to hit, who are the ones you should be visiting, who should you be following up with. We're going to show you how to create a sales process. If, you're, if you are a company that does not have a sales process, that does not understand a business cycle, this video is important for you, right? When you guys admit patients in your company, you guys have an admission process. 
right? And if somebody skips something, if somebody shortcuts something, things may fall through. Same exact thing when you're marketing your company. You can't just go out there and think things are going to happen naturally. Okay, so we're going to show you how to do the sales process, how to do your presentation properly. What are the mistakes that you're going to be facing, right? Because we all make mistakes, but guess what? We've made mistakes ourselves, right? My, for me, for example, I made a lot of mistakes in marketing, but I figured out how to be able to handle that so that I don't do it again. Or if it does come up, how can I actually solve it faster? How to handle objections. You guys heard it all. We don't have time to meet with you. We are, we are already working with another agency. Oh, you know what? I don't have any patients that needs home health yet. You know for a fact that that doctor just took care of another patient that had home health services. How to be able to learn how to get into the front of the nursing homes, into the hospital's preferred provider list, the do's and don'ts of marketing. You know, how to be able to find out different marketing strategies. What should I be giving out to people? Should I have lunch and learns? Should I not have lunch and learns? How much should I spend in a marketing target? Cold calling scripts. A lot of us don't even want to cold call. People are saying cold calling is dead. The reason why people say don't make cold calls because they themselves have quit on making cold calls because they themselves have faced so many objections. But guess what? If you are able to create an appointment, you have a 70% chance of getting that business than walking in cold by yourself live. Okay? So you guys have to understand, how do I handle a cold call? That's very much important. All these different series is available individually if you want to purchase them. If you want to purchase just the follow-up techniques, which we will show you guys a, a follow-up technique on how to be able to increase it, right? We're going to show you guys day one, day two, day three, day four, day five, every single thing you need to do to be able to increase that potential referral source to or for patients to you guys. You can purchase that particular series by itself that for $1.99, or we're gonna share with you guys our membership platform, okay? So let's go ahead and talk about that, right? So like I said, you're gonna have access to each one of these courses. You're gonna be able to purchase these individually, but if you join our online marketing university, which we have a membership program that we're gonna share with you guys in a few, okay? so that's what we do at 10 patientreferrals.com. This is a particular website right here, okay? When you go into that website, you're gonna see three memberships, okay? Three memberships. We have our platinum, our silver, and our gold membership, okay? And so right now as we speak, okay, right now as we speak, we talked about our online, our, our boot camp that's coming up all over, right? So guess what? Be, by the end of, of 2018, we're gonna remove a special thing that we're doing, okay? And so what we're doing is right here, right now. Platinum membership. You get full access on all the courses. If you purchase them individually, it's over $7,500 in value. Okay, just to let you guys know, when you purchase a particular series, you only have access to that for a whole month. Okay, so you're if you want access to this every month so that you can keep on going back and learning, right, you'll be paying $7,500 a month by just accessing those. But guess what? For a Platinum series, it's $149 a month. You have access to all of that. Plus, you get part of our quarterly mastermind meetings. That's a $3,000 value. And you also have access to us for one hour a month for coaching. Okay, that's a $2,500 value. And at the same time as we talked about our boot camp that we're having, you'll get one free ticket to any one of the boot camps that we're having. So separate it all totally, it's about $9,500 worth of value. And you can access that for $149 a month. Now, things go down a little bit. If you just want to do our silver membership, um, what's going to happen is you get the full access and you get a one ticket to our boot camp events. But just to let you guys know, we are going to be taking out that boot camp ticket soon once 2019 hits. So if you want to sign up, sign up right now to get that free ticket, okay? So right there alone, we suggest that to you guys. It's $79 a month. Now, if you want something in the middle, which most of our clients are using, it's just our gold membership. You get full access to the whole courses. You get one ticket to the live bootcamp, and you get the quarterly mastermind meeting available as well. So right there alone, we have so much information that we want to be able to give to you guys, and we want you guys to be able to access that right now. So you guys should definitely join
Like I said, I want you guys to be able to join this because this is what's going to create success. A lot of you guys are saying, hey, well, $149, that's a lot of money, Michael. I totally understand that. But guess what, guys? Let me ask this question for you guys. If I can show you and with the techniques I give you guys and you guys just get one patient by learning the tips, tricks, and techniques, one patient in a whole year. If you are a skilled nursing home, a skilled nursing home health agency, how much is one patient that's about three thousand to four thousand dollars that you're going to get as you know from Medicare, from their insurances, depending on the billing? Right there alone, it already paid for this particular item. But our goal is not to get you one patient. Our goal is to be able to double your referral sources, to increase it, to increase your patient census. That's what our main goal here for you guys is, to be able to learn how to be able to handle gatekeepers, how to get the appointments, how to present correctly, how to get physicians to start referring patients to you, to get these social workers to start using your agency. Once again, this is Michael at Home Health Success Academy. You have to understand agencies are having problems getting more referrals. A lot of larger agencies are expanding, opening up their own non-medical, adding hospice to them. So this is a cutthroat industry we're in right now. And then the person that actually educates themselves and learns how to succeed is our one that's going to be able to succeed and beat the other competitions. And if you don't join this, guess what? Your competition is joining this. If you don't attend the boot camp, guess what? People around your area is going to be attending the boot camps that we're having. So like, for example, our event that's coming up in Lakeland, Florida, we actually have people coming in from Georgia, coming in from Tennessee. We have one person that signed up that's coming from, you know, North Carolina. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to create these events to be able to create success for you guys. So make sure you guys sign up, whether it's our online learning platform or attending our boot camp, either or you should take this. This is amazing information that you guys should actually have your company. If you have any questions, contact us, 630-340-8990. Email us, info at homehealthsuccessacademy.com. But all the information is in our website, homehealthsuccessacademy.com. Our online learning platform is 10xpatientreferrals.com. If you have any questions, always know that home health is easy. Home health marketing is easy when you guys know what you're doing. This is Michael Echeverria. I look forward to seeing you guys in the boot camp. I look forward to talking to you guys in the film. Have a great day.